Christians. And if he went to a black church, if he went to the Wild Wild West, huh, he'd be asked to sit down front. Well, maybe not, no, maybe not in Freddie's church. No, no. <laughs> not in Freddie's church. Freddie don't play that. Right? So, we must socially isolate and ostracize those in our culture that do not give back to their own people. We don't have a whole lot of brothers who could write a check for $40 million and have anything left over. And then most of our athletes end up broke. And only a handful of them, we know who they are, are doing it. They go through millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. They give nothing back to their own people. And we allow that. That's okay. So as long as it's okay with us, it's going to be okay with them. So we must fix that. That's a consciousness. The third one, this is a tough one. We must coalesce around our vision and not just our pain. Every time somebody puts a bullet in one of our children's head, yes, we will saber rattle, we will march, we will yell, we will scream, as we should. We should be fighting for social justice on all fronts. No question about that. But try to organize black people around economic development, wealth creation, starting and building new businesses. Call for a march on that. Call for recycling black dollars. Call for boycotting businesses that do not support us. I don't know what BMW does for black people. I'll be honest with you, I don't know what BMW does. Now maybe they do something, but I don't know what it is. Right? Um, but black people buy more BMWs than any culture in America. And I don't know what they do. I don't see them at black conferences. I don't see their ads in black newspapers. I don't hear their ads on black radio. You ever hear a BMW ad on a black radio station? Oh no. You go to BMW and ask them for advertising or event or sponsorship support, they say, oh no, no, no. We don't support those things. We can reach black people through general market and they're going to buy our cars anyway whether we advertise to them or not. I know what Toyota does, I know what Ford does, I know what General Motors does, I know what Chrysler does, but I don't know what BMW does. But we buy more BMWs. Consciousness. Consciousness. Stop buying BMWs, y'all, and see what BMW would start doing in terms of investing in the things that are important to you. But we have we will not coalesce around that. That's a power. That's, that's power that we have that we do not use. Shame on us. Finally, I talked about it already. We have to connect the dots. We must leverage our collective resources and intellectual capital. That's the final thing that God wants us to learn how to do, is to work with and through each other. But that will begin with self-love. Because most, people, most black people do not love themselves because they don't even know who they are, as I said earlier. And you see, if I do not love me, there's no way that I can love you because when I look at you, you become a reflection of me. That's called low race esteem. And that's why we don't collaborate. That's why we don't do business. That's why we re recycle. We have low race esteem, which is driven by low self-esteem. So, that's part of connecting the dots. It's one of the things, for those of you who've come to the conference, you know that we have an African-centered opening. In other words, we go through the traditional prayer that we always do with everything that we do, generally speaking, and then we, we have a, a libations, and we honor the ancestors, uh, we take, we have a whole presentation on uh, our ancient history. Our ancient history. So, Connect the dots. And finally, we have to think entrepreneurially in every single thing that we do. We must think entrepreneurially, not, in, not only in terms of starting and building our businesses, but even for those of us who are working in the public and private sector workplace, we must take ownership of our responsibility. That's thinking entrepreneurially. Treat it like it's your own, that someday you may pivot out as I did and begin starting uh, and, and, or oh, start your own business. So if you think entrepreneurially, even when you're taking, even when you're working for somebody else, or as we like to say, even if you're on the plantation, think entrepreneurially. 
What can you learn? How are they doing this business? What is the business model? What is my role and responsibility in this business model? And then you take that knowledge, it's what I did with Procter & Gamble, it's what I did with United Way, it's what I did with the Ford Motor Company. I took that knowledge back to my own community, started my own business, and began teaching what I learned at the feet of masters. Procter & Gamble, 13 years, they're beasts. They invented branding, marketing, and promotion. Why not learn from the best? So I tell young brothers all the time, yes, you want to start a business, no question about that, someday. But A, learn on some, uh, somebody else's dime. Do you know how many, you know how much money I messed up of Procter & Gamble's? <laughs> I mean, literally millions. Right, mistakes I made 13 years, right? Messing up their money, learning, marketing, and branding. Right? That's mistakes that would have cost me. So, there's nothing wrong with working in the public and private sector so long as you have an agenda that allows you either at some point in time to pivot out of that and start to build your own business so you can create working jobs for our people or have a side hustle. There are two things going on in America 24-7. Somebody's buying and somebody's selling. Right now we're doing all the buying. So I say to brothers and sisters, learn to sell something. Sell something quarter time, half time, full time. You know, if you, if you bake cookies, put them in a box and sell it to somebody. If you live on a farm, take the manure. Put it in a bag. Put your name on it. And sell it to people. You could be, you could be an entree manure. <laughs> But stop doing all the damn buying. That's what we do. That's all we do. We buy stuff. You heard me? We don't produce anything that we buy, and we don't sell anything that we purchase. So think entrepreneurially. Understand the litmus test question. Is what I'm about to do good for my people? Finally, a couple of habits. I already told you about one bad habit we have. There are three habits I would like if I could wave a magic wand and embed these three habits into the subconscious mind of black people. I would do it tomorrow. And you need to do it. It would change the way you look at things. What is a habit? And a habit is an acquired behavior pattern regularly followed until it becomes involuntary. We have to develop habits. Uh, oftentimes, most of the things, half of the things we do, we're doing it by habit. We're driving, we're, we're driving and we're on the phone. How do you drive and be on the phone? It's a habit. It's a habit that you develop, okay? Um, so, three habits. You don't have to write them down. They're on the frog card. Habit number one. An insatiable appetite an insatiable appetite for personal growth and development driven by constant never-ending improvement and lifelong learning, right? This is actualized, brothers and sisters, by a greater knowledge of self. We talked about that. Read something other than about 400 years of slavery. We are much more than that. There is a powerful and awesomely written history about who we really are. This will help us to build self-esteem and black self-respect. This will be actualized by less entertainment. I already talked about the 10 hours of television a day that we watch, um, develop reading habits, make sure, and most importantly, even if you don't develop the reading habits, although your children um, will model the behavior that they see from you. Uh, make sure that your children can read. That's the most, you want to educate your children, you want to do the most important thing you can do for your child. The most important thing that, that happened to me in my lifetime was I fell in love with reading because of a third grade teacher, Mrs. Lambert, who understood that it, in third grade I was probably reading at a kindergarten level. Right? I'm from the hood. And <clears throat> We didn't have books in our house. We couldn't afford them. Um, and so she noticed that and she, and she said, Georgie boy, that's what they used to call me, Georgie boy, we're going to make sure that you could read. So this class for you. 
is only going to be about reading. So the only assignments I'm going to give you are books to read, and then you're going to write little book reports. And you're going to do that for the whole year. Right? And so I did. I fell in love with reading. I connected reading with love. How, how did I do that? I noticed that every time I read something and went up to an adult and sort of mimicked what I read, they would smile at me and they would show me some love and they would pat me on the head and say, hey, Georgie boy, where did you learn that? And I connected love with reading in my deep subconscious mind. And even to this day, I read a hundred books a year. Right? I've been reading a hundred books a year for 50 years. I have a high school diploma in woodworking because nobody thought I was college material. Right? But two honorary doctorate degrees. Right? So reading is important. So if you do nothing for your child, make sure they can read at grade level. If they graduate from high school, they should be reading at 12th grade level. M too many of our children graduate from school and can't read their own diploma. But they got out. But it's useless. They can't read. That's the most important thing. Now, uh, <clears throat> um, the second habit, a burning desire to be obedient to seeking the answer to this question, what does God want from me instead of what do I want from life? Two different answers. And then the personal discipline to do the work, to pay the price, and to stay the course. So what are we missing? What's a core core elements that we are missing in the context of our culture at this moment in time. Obedience and discipline. If you grew up in my era, those were the core characteristics and the core elements of raising black children back in the day. Obedience, both you speak when you're spoken to. You will not question your parents. You did what you were told. You were obedient. Right? And then discipline. The discipline to do the work necessary to take you and your family to the next level. So, a burning to desire, desire to be obedient, to seeking the answers um, to this question, what does God want for me instead of what do I want from, for myself? And then the discipline to do the work. Okay, that's the second habit. And then the third and final habit is an aggressive, never-ending personal and group focus on equity and ownership. Equity and ownership. We don't own anything. Go, to down, go in downtown Dallas. But all you fancy, professional, money-making Negroes in Dallas. And one of the reasons we came to Dallas is because we had read several reports is that Dallas was the number one city in black America for black professionals to move to. So we said, wow, very progressive population. Now, you go to downtown Dallas, and Negroes don't own nothing. Y'all might own a condo. Y'all don't own no businesses. Y'all don't own no buildings. Y'all don't own no land, no property. You own nothing. This is one of the richest cities in America. And Negroes own nothing. They own their churches. That's what we own. Other than that, mm -mm. there are a few businesses. Now, by the way, don't feel alone. Go to Atlanta, one of the most progressive black cities in America and go to downtown Atlanta. And them Negroes don't own nothing. Nothing. How about Chicago? Downtown Chicago used to be the bastion of black entrepreneurship. Well, we did own one building. How many of you know what building that was in downtown Chicago? The Ebony Jet Building. Mr. Johnson bought that building. That was huge news. Well, we lost that building. So in the most progressive, entrepreneurial 
city in America, we don't own nothing. So we must focus on equity and ownership. Now, why? There, there are many reasons. I don't have time to get into all of them, but I'm going to give you one. We'll put a pin in it and then come back at it at another time. Um, why is it so, port so important to own something in America? Because the tax system was set up for the landowner and the business owner. Why? Because landowners and business owners, brothers and sisters, in case no one has told you, wrote the tax laws. So if we're not landowners and we own the fewest number of homes per capita of any cultural group in this country and we came over here on the Mayflower. And if we don't own businesses and we own the fewest number of businesses per capita of any cultural group in America, you cannot fully exploit the American tax system. Why do you think Mitt Romney did not want you to see his tax returns? Not because he did anything wrong, but because he's a big time landowner and a big time business owner, he could fully exploit the American tax laws so that he's paying less taxes than you. But you don't own any land and you don't own no businesses. So becoming landowners and business owners and having equity and ownership enables you to keep more of your money if it's managed and done in the right kind of way. So that is important. We must move from this notion that my generation grew up on. And it was the right, it was the right mantra for us at that time. Our parents wanted us to get a good education and to get a good job. Why? Because they could get a good education back in the early 1900s or a good job. So that's what they wanted for their children, right? That's not what I'm teaching my sons. I have two sons. I'm teaching them to get a good education and create a job. Create a job for yourself. Create a job for your children. And if God gives you the power and the glory, we must create work and jobs for our people. As we close, I have a couple of things if you're interested. This talk that I just gave called Connect the Dots, this is the DVD of it. So if you want it as a DVD, here it is. I believe that Clifton uh, is going to put this up on YouTube, right? I believe that's where it's going so people can access this, this particular talk free. This talk here is about two hours long, so there's a lot more stuff in it. And then I have a couple of my latest, one of my latest books, my sister and I wrote, Who Would Have Thunk at the First Adventure of the Fraser Foster Kids? It's about my life as uh, uh, three kids growing up on the streets of Brooklyn, New York, Emma, George, and Joseph, that's my sister's name, and Joseph, uh, my younger brother who died, was killed in a drug deal that went bad. He was a drug dealer, big time heroin drug dealer. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's a, if you read between the lines, there's a lot to learn. It's a, it's, it's a book written for tweens, 7 to 12. Okay, but there's a lot of coding and hitting messages in it. Okay, um, now, uh, we are effectively out of time. We have been out of time. Um, so I, I was going to give you one other story. I'm, I'm going to cut that short. I'll save that for the next time. I want you to do a special favor for me. I want you to take the hand of the person on the left and the person on the right. And we will close as we opened in prayer. We will close in prayer. May we always remember those who have gone before us. May we be inspired by their vision and their valor. May their lives continually remind us that service is more important than success. That people are more important than possessions. That principle is more important than power. May whatever we do be shaped and molded by honesty excellence and commitment. May our children and our children's children carry forth with pride the nobility of the histories that are represented here and the various traditions 
that are represented in this room. To the creator of all of us, by whatever name we may refer to that creator, we dedicate our lives to make our world better and more beautiful. Can I get an amen? amen. Thank you very much.